breakfast puppies? Welcome to Have Movies Will Game, the only podcast on the globe where we take you, our friendly listener, through the best and worst movies of yesterday and today, and then discuss ways that you can play them at your gaming table. In every episode, our intrepid hosts, Matthew, Dusty, and Nathaniel, will filibuster fondly over facts and feelings of your favorite films, and then get to the glorious gaming goodness, giving game masters great gimmicks on generating golden genius. Have Movies Will Game, brought to you through the electronic wonder of the internet. Now, let's start the show! Okay, guys, what do you think of this movie? <laughs> uh, I, I I think when we do this, when we start the recording, we should we should start with Wagner. Uh, okay, well, da, da, I'll da, see da, if I can da. retroactively insert that. <laughs> oh, d- all right. We've yeah. been recording for like the, you, you know, know it's, five it's, it's it's been a while. <laughs> it's been a while. Someone, yeah, I know. It's it, it's been a while since I've seen this movie, and I kind of forgot. Oh, it's so good. One, how good it is. One, how horrific it is. Or two, rather, how horrific it is. Uh, three, everything in between those two things. Because this goes from one end of the spectrum very fast to the other end of the spectrum. And what movie are we talking about today? We are talking about Apocalypse Now by Francis Ford Coppola. You see, I disagree. I think it's a gradual build. I don't think it goes very quickly. The it's This is like an old Greek fable, mm-hmm. where as they go down the river, they go mad. Oh, yeah. You no, know, I, this yeah, is I very totally much see that. that. Speaking of things going mad, who are we again? Hey, I'm Matthew. And I'm Dusty. And I'm Nathaniel. And you're listening to Have Movies, Will Game. So this movie, Apocalypse Now, uh, for those of you, first of all, spoilers. I mean, it is a movie from 1979. Right. If it's you only 40 years old. If you haven't so seen spoiler it. spoiler alert. I mean, I can kind of understand because this is, a, this is a heavy Vietnam War movie that actually, like, production companies and theaters didn't want to show it because it, we were... Oh, just bet. coming out of the Vietnam War. I mean, War. first scene, it starts off with uh, with his dick out. So. Yeah, yeah. And uh, it was just kind of, it's a heavy movie. It is a heavy movie, and that's what I liked about it. Uh, not, not to not to get away from the the Pixar, but we've been doing fluff pieces, no. <laughs> and I I I wanted something like this. And You've I'm been really wanting something like this for this. a long time, and and I I totally respect this movie. Uh, it's just it it is not it's not one where you're like hey kids let's sit down and watch this with the tub of popcorn and see what's going on no oh man it's just, not uh, a family friendly movie martin sheen's face superimposed with the choppers at the very beginning mm-hmm. there's this there's this scene where he's he's going crazy in his room he's doing his like weird tai chi dance or whatever mm-hmm. And you just get this, he's got his head over his arm, mm-hmm. and there's light coming from one side, the rest of his face is in shadow, and you just see his eye. And I'm like, that's a man near a snapping point. Funny you should mention that, that whole sequence. So, hmm, Martin Sheen apparently was at one point in time, and you would never know this, was a massive alcoholic and liked to put a lot of cocaine up his nose. And he was dealing with a lot of stuff going on in his personal life, when this movie was being filmed, that whole sequence of was of the him, stuff alcohol and cocaine. Yes, that was him on the literal breaking point, and they, nice. he just he was screaming. It came through at the it camera good. crew to record everything he did. When he punched that glass, he doesn't even remember it. And the, later on, when they're like, "What happened to your hand?" When he said, "Well, I had a fishing, fishing accident," it yeah. was actually because they had been filming, and yeah, he was all hopped up on cocaine. He was all hopped up on, on alcohol. And, and let's not forget, kids, this isn't your modern day cocaine. This is 70s cocaine. Yes, and Way better. he actually had a heart attack uh, after that sequence was being yeah. done because he'd been, already been filming for so long. And uh, he had to go away for a little while. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah. Okay. And when, he, when he came back, uh, Coppola looked at him and went, 
You look too healthy. You look too good. Get back on the smack, dopehead. Pretty much. <laughs> well, that's that's just uh, what is it called? What what kind of acting is that? Method acting. <laughs> Method <laughs> acting. <laughs> I was waiting. For there that. were a lot of drugs in this movie, and yeah. I don't mean like just on film. I mean. Oh no! I, I, I caught I caught your your meaning. Yeah. No, I I know, but it may not have been conveyed over over uh, uh, the interwebs here. So Dennis Hopper, who you know, who's obviously in this movie. Oh dear he, God, Dennis Hopper is he like got a teenage Lawrence Fishburne who was fourteen at the time. He lied to get to work on this movie. Addicted. So to wait, heroin. wait, 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 wait. So so he lied about being fourteen, so his character could lie about being eighteen. Yes. To be in, nice. Yes. Uh, apparently Dennis Hopper got him addicted to heroin while Sam Bottoms was on at the same time during pretty much every one of his scenes, speed, acid, and marijuana. Well, they did a great job. Oh yeah. Yeah. This was, this was a fairly drug induced movie. Yeah. (laughs) You know, Hunter S. Thompson, you know, said it well. I like, uh, there's a lot of things Hunter S. Thompson said. Well, yeah, it's that, uh, you know, I don't recommend drugs, craziness, and violence to everyone, but they sure worked well for me. So, so going back on this, if uh, sorry for butchering that quote, by the way, it's okay. <laughs> this is this is a movie. If you if you aren't aware, it is during the the height of the Vietnam War, and basically, the, what's set for this movie is that the U.S. Army Captain Willard is sent by his colonel, who's played by a very young Harrison very Ford. Very young Harrison Ford. Technically, this was filmed prior to Star Wars. It was just after American Graffiti and just before Star Wars, but it took like 18 months to edit and get everything done. So Star Wars came out after, after this was all wrapped up and finished. Anyways, uh, sent by Harrison Ford, who plays Colonel Lucas, and a general to carry out the mission that way off the books and did and officially did not exist nor will it ever exist as it was said in the movie to seek out the mysterious grain beret walter kurtz played by marlon fucking brando (laughs) jesus christ what a performance he gave yeah like he was i'll I'll get into that when we get that we're still (laughs) I, i have lots to talk about before we get to marlon brando i like his shower scream when they haul him into the shower they oh, uh, when they're sobering him up to go in front of the colonel. Yeah, and then it blends into the that, music. Now that I know that he was just fucked out of his mind, that was I was like, wow, that's great acting. That looks real realistic. <laughs> it, because it was. it was real realistic. <laughs> so this movie is based off of a book called The Heart of Darkness. Now, yeah. we're not going to get into the differences between the book and the movie because I just don't want to. But the the movie initially, no, the book initially was written supposed to be in the in the uh, early 19th century and they were going down the Congo whereas this is supposed to be you know obviously Vietnam yep. war going going through uh you know everything that went on with the Vietnam war and there were a lot of movies that kind of came out around this same time or within the, you know 5 or 6 years of this movie uh that, that did focus on there was a resurgence of the of the the Vietnam war movies which enough time had passed i think we could look at it again I don't I, I don't know because I remember I remember going to see like Platoon. Uh, yeah. I, I saw it initially with my mom and I didn't know half of the, the stuff that was going on because I was a kid. But then I remember sitting there watching with my dad a second time. And now he was part of the Vietnam era, but he didn't get to go to Vietnam. He was stationed in Germany instead. But he had a lot of friends that went to Vietnam and they came back and they it was a movie they could not watch. Just yeah, like this movie, Full Metal Jacket, uh, Hamburger Hill. So... So when they sober him up and throw him in front of Harrison Ford and company. Yes. I love like that is an old military axiom. When an offer, when an officer offers you food, booze or smokes, Mm -hmm. they are about to fuck you. (laughs) They are about to abuse you in bad ways. I I really did like the, uh, them going over his list of accomplishments Mm -hmm. and you know, were you part of this assassination? You were part of that. You did this, you did that. And he's standing there going like, I can't go into that i i even if i could yeah. i wouldn't and it, it was great to see him obviously uncomfortable with the higher brass in front of him but then deflecting exactly yeah. how he should the most memorable part of that scene to me was the one guy who just sat there and stared at him and had one line yeah and that was it yeah the, i think the, he was the, actually an assistant civilian, director yeah. he was a civilian mm-hmm. advisor yeah, yeah. He just sat there and stared very intently on him. I love <laughs> the use of darkness in oh, this movie. There's great so, for like it. light was so sparing. Um, 
like even outside there was just it, it's if i if i could film something one tenth as good as as this i i could do an oscar sweep today there's a reason why it's so dark it's the cocaine no no okay actually, the okay reason... it's the heroin <laughs> um the reason for it is because Marlon Brando had signed up to do this movie. And this movie was basically a paycheck for him. He was guaranteed like $4 million up front. Didn't matter uh, what he did or how long he was there. It, it was Monday through Friday only, and, and his filming was done by 5.30 in the afternoon. Right. That was it. He had just come off of doing the Godfather movies. And the part for his character is a ve- was you know a very stocky but well-built Green Beret. And he came in weighing over 300 pounds. Yeah, an aging Green Beret. Yeah, I, I aging, got that. Yeah, and, and Coppola freaked the fuck out because he's got this, you know, fat-bellied Green Beret now. Mm-hmm. And so he had he had to, on the fly, change everything to film it to where it was darker in most scenes uh, with him, which had to make, he had oh, to go ahead and turn worked. everything that oh, was now darker worked. and everywhere else so that so it wouldn't look like it mm. was contrasted too much. But then the the camera angles to make him look more like he was like six eight or six nine yeah. and just an imposing guy. It, it, it got that you got this 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 primate feel about yes. him. I like this 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 wise ape mm-hmm. um, because he spends a lot wise. of time. <laughs> no, no, wise, eloquent thinker, like warrior poet. Like they talk. About, he's not yeah. good, but that's not necessary to be a thing. True. I understand that Coppola is actually largely responsible for Brando's rebirth. Yeah, in cinema. Yes, in the seventies. Yeah. yeah, yeah. With with the Godfather series, he was more or less done uh, before Godfather. I, I know a lot of people argue that. And you by know, a few he, movies. you mean Brando? Yes, Brando. Yes. Yeah. yes. Uh, now Coppola apparently lost over a hundred pounds and almost had a psychotic break and had a heart Trying attack. Trying to chase all these fucking actors movie. around that are all <laughs> fucked up. Yeah, his you know his cameo. He was pretty uh, <laughs> intense. Yeah, he was intense. <laughs> wait, wait, wait. Who? He was when they when they landed when to go surfing. The yeah. guy with the camera that was like, "Just go by, just go by, just go by." Oh, that was the camera. That was that's Francis Ford Coppola. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of like the scene in uh, what was it? Uh, going to in, um, oh, the Lord of the, the Fellowship of the Rings, where Peter Jackson makes that that appearance when they're going to the, what the prancing pony or something like that. Okay. Yeah, I love slow paced movies like this where they you spend time with each character, and you, you watch them move. Instead of just like expostulate on the various lines they have, but you you watch them move within their character. No, they grow and they. Well, it's it's not just the character development. I mean, you you silently watch them. They don't they don't have a line. They're just moving within their world, mm-hmm. kind of like uh, like uh, the, uh, Marlon Brando waking up the first time he meets him, and you know you just see the the shine on his skull mm-hmm. and his hands in the water, or um, when uh, Chef is going about his his duties on the boat and they're they're not talking. I mean there's a there's a lot of just of just motion of of uh physical acting that's just amazing from everybody. No, oh, I, I agree. I completely agree. There's a lot with this movie I think that I will agree with you on this, but it is also a difficult movie. I mean it is it's Oh yeah. And I, and I don't mean by like pacing or anything. It, it it's it's it's, it's during, difficult to watch. Yeah, it, it's during a period of our history with it, it is a it's kind of a it's a stain period of our own history. So it's just difficult. I love the smell of napalm in the morning. Duvall thought that was going to get cut. He said that and he's like, I went over the top on that. I, that's going to be the first thing that gets cut and is one of the most quoted and remembered lines from this movie. I like uh, when, when they're, when they're doing the village scene mm-hmm. um, where there's the, the propaganda person with the translator next to him telling, talking to the villagers. He's like, we are here to help you explosion. We will not harm you. Explosion. <laughs> and the very next scene are them stealing cows with a helicopter. <laughs> Prior to uh, Coppola doing this movie, actually Orson Welles was going to adapt the the novel uh, and do a uh, do a, do his version of the movie based on it in 1939. But he initially, but he decided to make Citizen Kane instead because the production company that he was going with thought it would be too risky of a movie. Well, I mean. No one's ever heard of this Citizen Kane you said the name was. (laughs) (laughs) Bad call. You know, uh, Orson Welles gets a lot of acclaim for Citizen Kane. And he had some other, like, really striking things. But Orson Welles had a lot of stinkers. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So, basically, Brando. Like, Brando's looked upon 
you know, in retrospect, is one of the greatest actors of all of cinema. And yet Brando was a contentious character who wasn't always considered a great. Yeah. Yeah. I, I agree. He had, he had, there's some movies that there's, I, I think my favorite movie with, with Brando uh, is it's nothing deep. It, it, it's got Matthew Broderick in it. It's, it's called the freshman. Oh God. I remember. That's your favorite movie <laughs> with Brando. Brando. Yeah, I'm not I think a he huge won an Brando. Oscar for that. Yeah, I think yeah. so. I'm not a huge at this Brando time. They're just throwing them at him. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> uh, I'm Wasn't not... his character kind of a Godfather, a yeah. spoof of or himself? A, yes. yes, of the of the Corleone character. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 And it had um, oh, I forgot. It was it was uh, the guy that played in the the, the man in the glass booth. Uh, yeah. I forget his name. Anyways, different movie. I love the concept of a unit that's been around since cavalry time, Big Duke's unit. Mm -hmm. um, like they, it says in the movie, they traded in their horses for helicopters. Yeah, I, I loved I, that whole diatribe about. You know, them. Yeah. I I would have followed Big Duke into into hell too. Oh he yeah, took it was care great. of his men. He was a bit crazy, but I mean, it was Vietnam. What are you going to do? Six foot beaks. Yeah. Any, any any man that can lay there with his guts held in with a with a with and then just walks away <laughs> <laughs> and, like and he's the, about to give the guy water. And he's like, oh. Squirrel, and that's and, and that kind of goes back to something you said a few moments ago that there's so much there is so much going on if you yeah. just look around like that one little scene where the 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 guy holding his guts in and he's just like grasping for the water and, yeah. and it's the camera is focused on Duval and the guy with him but the guy down below is like nope nope give me yeah. give me the water get off oh, fucker it's pretty hairy in there sir it's Charlie's point Charlie don't surf <laughs> <laughs> initially George Lucas was set to direct this film I'm glad he didn't. Yeah, it it it, it was uh, it was it, it it passed by him. Well, he had a hand in it in, 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 what, in, in the early development. He did as, have a hand as in what it. it is. It's it's perfect as is. Yeah, all all the flaws, all the people's heart attacks. It was worth it. This is a magnificent piece of cinema. Well, the difference where Lucas was going to go with it was his initial plan was to shoot it as a fake documentary on 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 location in South Vietnam, while the war was still going on. That was the initial thing. Uh, Coppola, who ended up this, being... This is why movies are so expensive with insurance now, <laughs> because directors got to do shit like this in the past. There's a lot that went on with this movie on stuff like that, too. Uh, but Coppola, who at the time was the executive producer, tried to get the film made as a part of a production deal with Warner Brothers. That deal, as a lot of movie deals, fell through, and Coppola went on to, to direct The Godfather. By the time both uh, Lucas and Coppola were powerful enough to get the film made, Saigon had fallen... Yeah. And Lucas was busy making Star Wars and Milius had no interest in directing the film whatsoever. So Lucas gave Coppola his blessing to direct it. But in the long run, Coppola, Coppola and Lucas's friendship was strained for a handful of years due to Lucas not wanting to direct the film. I could see that. Yeah, me too. One of my one of my favorite lines, which I think has had like the serial numbers mm -hmm. rubbed off and moved into like people use this for a variety of things now. It's like never get out of the boat never get out of the fucking boat <laughs> <laughs> i think that's used in a lot of yeah it's parlayed i think into a lot of horror yeah. movies never get also. out of the van yeah. <laughs> never get out of the van <laughs> never go in the house never, never go, go in the, in the garage. house yeah <laughs> and it has a lot of really good lines because milius i mean milius did conan yeah and he's done a number of other in 1984 or not, not not 1984 sorry red dawn from 1984 and a number of other really good movies and he actually wrote the entire script listening to not not only the doors like predominantly the doors but wagner those are the two things he listened to and what a song to start a movie on yeah yeah right well wow. coppola coppola went to school with, and with the doors with and Red. and the movie on too yeah coppola went to school with jim morrison and knew the doors like personally so uh he asked him was like hey can i use your 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 music we don't have anything scored yet can i use your your guys' songs for this movie so this is basically a two and a half hour music video to the doors yeah which is kind of cool because i'm a big um, fan of the doors you know a buddy of mine uh is is serving now and he gave me this uh i won't say his name because he can't do this he gave me a crate of mres mm -hmm. and uh i had one while i was watching this and i think i know why soldiers go mad now <laughs> <laughs> that was, probably that was that was rough yeah those mres are not good i think it was the cracker like there was uh they don't matter oh, no. oh, 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 oh. nicely played thank you god now i want to do that 
<laughs> Milius also went on to explain how, that he came up with the title for Apocalypse Now. So apparently it was derived from a very popular tattoo uh, among the, at the, the time, the hippie community, of a peace sign that said Nirvana Now. All right? Plain enough. Milius uh, added a couple extra lines, edited the peace symbol to make it look like a circle with a B-52 bomber in the middle, and changed the slogan to Apocalypse Now. And it's actually not the film's original title. Early drafts of the 1,000-page screenplay was named The Psychedelic Soldier. I could see that. Yeah. I could see that well, because as a kid, when back when video stores were a thing, mm -hmm. um, I would walk walk past this movie, and I'm like, oh, post-apocalyptic movie. Nice. Like, because it was... It, it, the cover looks like uh, Red Dawn. It has the same like color scheme. Yeah, I mean I, that's what I thought it was, but like I saw it. I want to say thirties. I, I never saw it till I was thirty, and I was like, oh. <laughs> I mean, if you take it outside of the context of history and just look at it for what it is, it could be a mid-apocalypse movie. Mid-apocalypse yeah. happening currently, you know. It's, it's a slow apocalypse. <laughs> <laughs> it's a molasses. That, that, that's the best way to run an apocalypse slow yeah just kind of that way you get glacial. keep all the people concentrated no one runs screaming away oh, but let's not go there yeah i didn't bring my tinfoil hat so being in a war zone on acid may be the worst trip possible probably I, but i i want i want to speak about the luck of the fucked up because he's sticking his head over that trench and he's just lights sounds flares <laughs> and uh, just I like his his whole arc, uh, mm -hmm. the uh, surfer guy mm -hmm. was basically like a dare cautionary tale for acid. <laughs> because he, yeah, he I, I can agree with that. He wasn't he was okay before that. Like, but that that is the longest lasting tab of acid that he's been saving. That that lasted him for weeks, and he was never the same. <laughs> you can't you can't go through a war with your head fucked up like that. No, but I could I could understand why he was doing it to deal with everything because not a survivable concept. No, but it it, it can it can prolong things and make things just going into that whole state. It can make you just not there enough to make everything numb. I'll just say without going into detail on mm -hmm. how I know, but the luck of the fucked up is a very real thing. Oh, oh, I agree with you on that. I completely agree with you on that, and and I think that the, that a lot of people have to go through that. Man, when Clean dies and that tape keeps playing, mm -hmm. that that was a rough part. Yeah, I didn't know that was Lawrence Fishburne to the end. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, yeah. It was like his first movie. It did take Francis Ford Coppola nearly three years to edit all of the footage because he shot well over two hundred hours of film, which was damn. It, it's obscene. That's not only getting into, but going well past Stanley Kubrick level of of filming. Uh, it's just, there was so much going on and there was a lot that had to be redone. Like Martin Sheen had to, had to come back in and do a lot of, of retakes, but he wasn't available because he was filming another movie. So his brother, Joe, uh, Estevez, uh, who sounded almost nearly identical to him, did a lot of the voiceovering. That's some ADR. So when you hear him talking in the beginning, that's not Martin Sheen. Oh, really? That's actually his brother doing that, that opening. And also his brother had been used as a stand in. Uh, after Sheen had suffered his heart attack uh, in, in, after the, the opening sequence, so but he wasn't he wasn't credited. Sheen has a very memorable voice. Yeah. yeah, he was in one of my favorite video games of all time, Mass Effect Two, which I think is a masterpiece. Yeah. And in you that can't see game, this, but Dusty's wearing oh, yeah, a Mass Effect Two shirt. <laughs> Mass Effect yep. Two, I think, is it's a, it's a technical storytelling and gameplay masterpiece. And his character is the elusive man, your, your patron through most of the story. And they made him look like a younger Martin Sheen. And he had the voice of Martin Sheen. And it was just amazing. Like, you just felt like you were hanging out with Martin Sheen. The I think, whole time. And that's awesome. <laughs> and I, I think a lot of actors are, are beginning, especially actors that are maybe uh -huh. not as popular as they once were in films because they, you know, they've, they've aged or they've gotten older, they've gotten bigger, what have you, whatever's happened. I think they're finding a good resurgence of their acting abilities in video games. Cause there's a lot that goes on in the video games. Now yeah. they are very cinematic in scope. It doesn't even have to be now. I mean, wing commander, Mark oh, Hamill. Yeah. yeah. That's one of my favorite roles for Mark Hamill. Actually. Yeah. 
So we did talk a little bit about Brando. Oh, let's talk more about Brando. Now, this is a villain. This, this, oh, is, one the, villain. this is one of the great villains. Yes. They're on the technical side. Brando improvised most of his dialogue throughout this no entire shit. movie. No shit. Including an 18 minute speech where Coppola was just like, I'm going to let this record and you just have at it. So, so what was he fucked up on? Whatever, whatever he's fucked up on ham. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I've been there. I've been fucked up on ham, but two minutes of it survived the final cut. And uh, there was a, a documentary that was made uh, called Brando uh by a a peter monso and he later heard the entire monologue and said that while most of it was incoherent (laughs) a good chunk of it was like ostensibly brilliant and at the end of the speech brando reportedly told francis ford coppola quote francis i've gone as far as i can go if you need more from me you can get another actor end quote Mm. so yeah so a lot of that was just him rambling and some of it it's it's beautiful yeah but then this is this is a this a lot is a, of editing this is a villain that you have some empathy for because it's very obvious that what he's had to do is what broke him he had traveled his river as far as he could mm-hmm. and he knew he, he looked around back. and all of a sudden he was a crazy you know yeah he was he was a crazy person he, he was a psycho he knew there was no coming back yeah. from it. i like his invitation to willard mm-hmm. um to tell his son about what he did all of it i mean that that shows like when we get into uh, the alignments later Mm -hmm. that that's very important yeah it is um there there's there's this weird i i said this earlier but there's this weird like ape-like primate strength to him Mm -hmm. in this movie and some of that was the filming uh as you said earlier he showed up you know massively overweight so yeah (laughs) um but he shows this like relentless purpose and through his his Brando mumblings, uh, he shows that this <laughs> this really deep understanding. Yeah, I, could, of, I agree of with that. Like uh, of human nature, and one thing that I really liked about his character is you could see how he got there. I think that's very important for a villain. I agree with that. It's it's I. There's one thing that I hate in a lot of movies where you have the villain, and. You, Sometimes it works where the villain is just the villain and you know this is the villain and you don't yeah. need to know the path of how the villain got to become the villain. This is a very good example of here's the path and, and how you just said here, we're going to show you how he became the villain without, I mean, you could do a whole other movie of just everything going and, on from yeah. Brando's point of view, his character's point of view. What, what I got from it was it felt like he was a thinker who had been like a, an intelligent man, uh, a, a man who understood people around him who was just surrounded by too much horror for too long. Like massive PTSD. Yeah. Like uh, empathic people tend to take on what's around them. And this struck me as like uh, an introspective warrior who had seen way too much and just, yeah. just became the jungle. Yeah. Yeah. Became the jungle and became the river. Horror. He saw into the heart of darkness and embraced it. Yeah. Well, you got to do what you got to do, yeah. man. <laughs> One of the most iconic scenes out of this movie is the helicopter napalm attack. Yeah. That took uh, a year to actually compete, to go to set up film and complete 10% of the entire film's footage, uh, which was approximately 130,000 feet of, of film was from that one sequence alone. And it's a beautifully shot sequence, but that was, that's a lot of film. Yeah. That's a lot of cellular. Now it's just like, Oh, it's digital. Hey, cool. We can, we just, Oh, we toss that, me another SD. That two terabyte <laughs> yeah. card filled up. Give me another one, and we'll just go at it. And the ex- the expense that this movie went through, and for the time, nineteen seventy nine, well, it started in nineteen seventy six, uh, thirty one and a half million dollars. Which today's by today's inflation standards, it's a little bit over a hundred million dollars. So if we look at movies now that are a hundred million dollars, you've got that's almost an indie movie. Well. I mean, like the bar has been raised on indie movies. What what they cost? Well, well, okay. So the original cost of this would be an indie. I'm saying, like now, like 100, you know, that the 130 million. That's that's a decent blockbuster movie, is it? Yeah, because I think uh, like I think a number of the MCU movies were like 200 in the 200 million range to yeah. film. Uh, so, but it did not do well on its return opening 
yeah, it, it did not do well at all. Uh, yeah, it's not movie. a date movie. No, it, it's not a date movie at all. It's, uh, I mean, unless you're really into that. Uh, opening weekend, okay, so the, the budget was $31.5 million. Opening weekend, it took in $118,000. Oh, yeah. Gross uh, was, it took in $83 million. So it made its back, made double back, but still for that big of a production yeah. and how long it was going into and everything that went into it, it, it should have made, I, I think it should have made probably into the 150 at the time. Sometimes you got to do a passion piece though. And I think this, that's what this was. The best ones often are. This was from Martin Scorsese. He signed over, like he threw out a number of his Oscars because he didn't think he was going to be able to finish this. He signed over like the, the mortgage on his house. He had more money like loaned to him to get this done and, and went into Hawk like 2 million of his own dollars, which late seventies, that's, I mean, it's still a lot today, but then that was like, Oh my God. Uh, so he went into, into Hawk to get this movie and he almost lost his life because of it. Cause he did threaten to commit suicide a number of times uh, during the course of this film. A lot of the, so the U S United States army did not loan any mil any military hardware for this movie. Initially, they I said, imagine not. They initially said they were going to, and then they got in through the script, and it was the yeah, one line no. where it was "Kill Colonel Kurtz," and they went like a blackjack dealer. We're out. Yep. We're done. Either you change that, or you get nothing. And Coppola said, "I'm not going to change it." So they had to uh, borrow hardware from uh, Marcos. What was going on at that time in, in that region? Uh, Francis Ford Coppola went to President Marcos of the Philippines to borrow his gunships at the time. Now, they were going on in their, their real life, their own little like yeah. civil war at the time. So during filming, they would get called to go actually attack uh, several other areas. So they would like turn filming over to pilots that had no idea what was going on in the movie. And the pilots would like have to, they would, there was no translator or anything. They just have to point like where they wanted to go. Yeah. And it created a huge clusterfuck, apparently. So, yeah, that's a thing. Wow. <laughs> they killed that cow for real. Yes, they did. I that was, was gonna, one dead cow. I was going to bring that up. Yep. Uh, there's a lot that went on. Uh, yeah, the water buffalo slaughter was was real, uh, which was also inspired by a ritual performed by the local Ifuago tribe. As long as they ate it. Whatever. Uh, yeah, I guess, yeah. Uh, <laughs> so because, it looked clean. That first cut was pretty impressive. Well, because the American production is subject to American humane laws and being filmed were filming where they were filming, they didn't have those same laws. They could do basically whatever they wanted. Uh, another uh, issue that would not have happened here in the United States if it were filmed, the iconic opening scene with the palm trees burning under the storm of napalm, mm -hmm. that involved the destruction of a real forest. It was roughly 1,200 gallons of gasoline was poured over palm trees and then set on fire. Yeah. Tires were actually burned to get that heavy black smoke. Uh, Francis Ford Coppola later said, they'd never let me do this in the United States. The environmentalists would have killed us. Yeah. The, yeah. the thing about jungle, though, is that it's, it's way stronger than napalm. Yeah. That, that's, that's three years, and it's, it's just back. That's just the way it works. The other, um, at least in Southeast Asia, that's that that's different jungle. You made a comment about the the water buffalo and the realism with that because they actually yeah. did. So, do you know the story about the, all the dead bodies? No. Okay. So there are dead were bodies. those real too? There's this a movie lot of, is great. There's a lot of of dead bodies in this movie, obviously because of the time, what's going on. Yeah. So this was an indication of how uh, the the edges blurred between art and reality. So Kurtz's jungle stronghold, you know, that hell hole mm -hmm. of like medieval barbarity and all that good stuff with all the skulls and everything. The, uh, the, I thought it was beautiful. I didn't get barbarous yeah. from it at all. I just oh. saw overgrown temple complex, you know, old city. Okay. The overly enthusiastic props manager decided that the dummies were no longer any good for the purposes that they were being created for. And so, he wanted actual corpses to lie yeah. on the ground and hang from the trees to give, quote, real atmosphere. This is what I'm talking about, 70s quote. cocaine. It makes you do things <laughs> like this. So, this is a great idea, guys. There, hey, hey, hey. What if we got <laughs> real body? So there was a local man who supplied cadavers to medical schools oh, who was hired to supply the dead bodies until horrified senior production staff realized what was going on. <laughs> he was called the sinister supplier, as it was turned out, 
Uh, he oh been, my god! He had been creeping out at night <laughs> and also <laughs> robbing graves. Oh, god. The local police showed up on set to investigate. The passports of the production team temporarily confiscated. An army truck arrived on scene to cart the bodies away to give them a proper burial at that point. And after that, authenticity had to rely on the evil smelling garbage that was strewn everywhere. And also very large real rats that came in because of the dead bodies. And now all the garbage that was used to create the same smell of dead bodies since they couldn't use the dead bodies that Dr. Sinister brought in. It's very important to have the smell. (laughs) Jesus. Remember when we were talking about ice pirates and you take a lot of cocaine and a decent amount of production money and you make a movie? This is that. Yeah, but this is this is like a grim dark version of that. Yeah, that's that's true. Ice Pirates was levity. This is <laughs> this is not levity. I think one of the things I like about Brando is in some small way anyone who's a thinking person can feel how he got there. Mhm. You know? Brando or Kurtz? Excuse me, Kurtz. Okay. Yeah, Kurtz. <laughs> so like, yeah. The well, thing about I, Brando well, is yeah. that if you like roast beef <laughs> and you're addicted We've to ham, we've got the meat. Uh, he did imp- improvise the line. And it is this probably, episode not brought to you by Arby's. It's probably one of my favorite lines from him. And I think it's one of a lot of people's favorite lines from him. You're an errand boy sent by grocery clerks to yeah. collect a bill. Yeah. That was improvised. That was really good. <laughs> it was. Uh, I like, I really liked the, after, and can we talk about the kill for a second? Sure. Uh, like we already talked about the cow, but the juxtaposition of the, of killing for meat versus killing for Brando's Mm -hmm. or Kurt's, (laughs) Uh, it's, that was an amazing scene. I I love that he he put his kill face on Mm -hmm. and he's coming out out of that chocolate milk looking fucking river. And his eyes are all crazy, and you know he's there for a he, fucking kill. He was. <laughs> I mean, he's he's not here for a dinner party. He's not there to survive. He's there to he's there to kill, and it's just dripping off of him like jungle sweat. Mm-hmm. Oh, it's, it's so good. I wanted to talk about the tribesmen at the end real fast. Okay, after he does his kill, mm-hmm. where they just where they just kneel, like he stands out, and it's more than enough to overwhelm him, and he has just killed their leader. I think. That speaks to a very humanness that we've forgotten. It's that we've all gone down this very dark path and we've done this thing, right? Mm -hmm. And every tribesman knows that you probably shouldn't crucify the people and the children and lay their bodies along the river or make nice little skull mountains. Maybe not the thing to do. And they knew that. And they knew that there would be a payment for that. And, And Kurtz knew it too. And I, I thought that was a very, that was a very primal human moment where it's like, okay, okay, yeah, all right, that's over, okay, we're, we're not, that. we're not going to take revenge, we, we're just going to go do something else now. Yeah, the bill was paid. Yeah, yeah. like, like there, there's a sense of fate about it or, or fatalism that I think is, uh, it's, it's very moving and it's lacking in a lot of movies that you see today. It would just be expedience. Where yes. he he would go superhero and fight his way clear. It, it wouldn't be that that shared understanding that humans have that we've we've all gone too far and this this moment is past. So he's going to walk away and we're going to go about our business. I I took it as him. That was the he paid his his toll going into hell and going and being able to go back home. Yeah, because he made comment early early on. He had, he did his first tour. And and he did in he in the entire time that he was at home, he was thinking about being back in the jungle. Yeah, he and was then, begging for a mission. Yeah, and then being back in the jungle, he was just dreaming about nothing about going home. And he, and the whole thing, that whole river sequence is for him is his descent into not only madness but into hell. And that was his. He paid his. He gave his silver to get home. Yeah, very much. I agree. Fucking great movie. We should probably take it to the gaming table though. Yes. Are we going to give it a rating? Let's see. How many apocalypses would you give? No, 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 no. No? no, no. How, how many Brandos? No. How many Kurtzes? How many, how many surfboards? Ooh. How many napalms? How many napalm surfboards? I was going to actually, I was going to say how many, how many Valkyries? How many Wagners? How many dead Kurtzes? <laughs> I like the surfboards. I like yeah, the let's, surfboards. Yeah, let's just do surfboards. Um, um, not, not. Uh, out of 10? Uh, yeah, but give a, give a reason why the 10. I normally use, you know. 10 like, out of 10. It, it's a perfect movie. I it is a perfect far. movie. 
What, what's okay. wrong with it? Uh, well, technically nothing. Yeah, technically nothing. Yeah, all right. Ten surfboards. Yeah. I'm torn because... You, you've actually been... I'm sorry to interrupt. You've been you, really you've quiet. You've been fairly quiet this entire first half. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so I, I used to love this movie, and that was a long time ago. But I am a different man now, and I consider myself to be a more sensitive person and more deeply personal, personally bothered by atrocity. And fair. Watching it last night, I had to stop halfway through. I got to the scene with the boat and the puppy and the insanity that happened. It's like, I I can't finish this anymore. My father died from exposure to Agent Orange in Vietnam. Oh, wow. And that era is, the older I get, uh, I, I have now outlived him. And the older I yeah, get, too. the more sensitive and uh, touched I am by Vietnam. And anything set in Vietnam is, I wasn't, I ha- I didn't serve. Yeah. I've never done anything in the military, but I get triggered. So uh, uh, it was tough. I couldn't finish it. Okay. Yeah. That's you fair. You have a valid yeah. reason. Yeah. yeah. It's very fair. Very valid. It, it is a difficult movie. The game section is going to be very interesting today. <laughs> Okay, well, on that fantastic segue, let's take it to the gaming table. We'll be right back. Hi, this is Matthew. Thanks for listening. We wanted to take a moment to talk to you about uh, one of our sponsors, Guardian Games. Guardian Games has been with us since the very beginning of this show. Guardian Games is Portland's premier game store. They have magic miniatures, shelves and shelves and shelves and shelves of RPGs, all the gaming swag, anything you could possibly want for your gaming experience. If you're ever in Portland and looking for a gaming store, Guardian Games is the biggest, most diverse store in Portland. You definitely owe it to yourself to go to Guardian Games. Bringing this to the gaming table, Dusty, take it away. All right. Well, the cast, uh, there's gonna, there's a number of people that were that were given parts early on, and they they had dropped out, just like every movie that happens. But initially, Harvey Keitel was cast as Willard. Uh, two weeks into shooting, Francis Ford Coppola replaced him with Martin Sheen. Two weeks into shooting? Yes, two weeks into shooting. That's. That's a blow, the man. Front, it's almost like the uh, Back to the Future where Eric Stoltz was changed out for Michael J. Fox like several weeks How into it. How do you get it. over something like that? They're like, no, go home. We have someone else. I, I mean, <laughs> that's rough. After that, Nick Nolte had said that he never wanted to play a role more than Captain Willard and was very disappointed when Coppola Nick hit Nick Nolte it. could have done it, man. He is. He has crazy. Yes. He is all crazy. Yep. Yeah, I don't uh, normally say... That I mean, I think Martin Sheen did a great job, but I also think Nick Nolte could have really done that. Speaking of people I can never tell apart in my brain, Gary Busey and Nick Nolte are the same they, they person. They're the same person. It's a clone. Oh, wow. Okay. They're both crazy enough I can't to think picture that's funny. Nick Nolte. I can only picture Gary Busey. Oh, see, and it's also because Nick Nolte did a movie a number of years after this. Uh, I, I forget the name of it, but he he was American uh, soldier that be, became a POW, and he ended up becoming like the king of this village somewhere in Vietnam. Oh God, I remember that. What was that? He has big Eagle tattooed on his chest. Yeah. Anyways. Oh yeah. Sorry. Uh, Nicholson was all Jack Nicholson was offer, also offered the role Fuck of Willard. No. no. Uh, and uh, Francis Ford Coppola also asked Al Pacino to play Willard. No. Also no. But Pacino yeah. turned it down saying, I know what this is going to be like. You're going to be up in a helicopter telling me what to do. And I'll be <laughs> down in the shitty swamp for five months. Fuck you. Uh, the <laughs> that's shoot that's actually, fair. The, the shoot actually lasted 16 months. Uh, Clint, was it? It was shot it was there, 16 right? Months, yeah. 16 months in the Jesus. sweltering jungle. Yeah. And Wow. Clint Eastwood turned down the role of Captain Willard because he felt the film was too dark. I think Eastwood would have done a really good job. James, no. maybe he's too stoic. No, no. Yeah. he doesn't. He doesn't no. emote with his face much. Mm-mm. No, I he disagree. He just but... glares. Oh, okay, he just glares. You, you have to open your yeah. eyes to have a facial expression. Yeah, I'm sorry. Uh, no, that's fine. Uh, James Caan, uh, I don't from know who that is. he was in the Godfather movies. Uh, was uh, first choice to play Colonel Lucas. However, Khan wanted way too much money uh, for what he considered a minor part in the movie. Get that new kid, that new kid, the, the Harrison Ford. And I hear he's doing good things. Yep. <laughs> uh, Steve McQueen was actually uh, rumored to be part of the movie with being Captain Willard. 
he had initially verbally agreed to play him when Coppola agreed to his salary of a $3 million payday. But after thinking about the work that how much it would require, he uh, decided to say no. All right, we're three minutes in and we're still talking about other people. So let's talk about Martin Sheen. All right. <laughs> Martin Sheen. It's Martin fucking Sheen. Yeah, exactly. So, Martin uh, Sheen th- playing Willard, yep. uh, this, the yep. Army Special Operations officer who was serving uh, in Vietnam for three years prior. What's his alignment? Oh, he's lawful neutral. Yeah, I would cha- fucking agree. Not 100%. chaotic? Like no area no. of chaos? No? No. Okay. no, he had a mission. Yeah, no, he- good point. Yeah, just do it. Like, And right. I go with neutral as opposed to my usual protagonist being somewhat good aligned mm-hmm. uh, for when he uh, shot the wounded woman on the boat for expedience. Uh, he had a mission. He was going to do it. He is not a good aligned character. Yeah, I never really noticed him, at least from my memory and from watching it again last night, what... I never noticed him do anything particularly good. No, he had something to do and yeah. he set out to do it. Yeah. He was the very definition of lawful neutral. So what, sticking, what, what do you think, Dusty? You, you, you're no, I can, I, I just, your brow. just the reason why my, 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 my brow was being furrowed on that was because he came in as a, as a soldier mm-hmm. and maybe it's because I don't have any, you know, background in, in, in the military. I don't see how, how a lot of this works out. Um, but, yeah, he was following orders, but his actions kind of leaned more towards a, a chaotic. And yeah, he did have, he had to do what he needed to do, but it was still kind of like, was it just the, the means justify the end or how to get to the he end He kept point? driving the boat forward. I mean, he was he was on mission. He was, okay. that that's the law. And he wasn't going about it in a good or evil way. He was just this doing is, his orders. This is a movie where the alignments really mess with me because it mm-hmm. is that, de- like we talked about the the first part of this, that descent into madness for yeah. each character and, and it's all their own journeys. He, he stayed so on it's, target it's though. Like I mean, where the lines blur for me so much on this one. So I, I might be 180 out on you guys. What, what do you think setup. though? What you got? I'm just going to default with what you guys said. Okay. <laughs> on to the next. On to the next. All right. On to the next. We have Marlon Brando as Colonel Walter E. Kurtz. <laughs> oh, and sorry. Uh, motivations of, of uh, Willard clearly do the mission. Oh. Okay, yeah, yeah, he was yeah. he was a professional. Yeah, he's a professional. All right, so anyway, Brando, yeah, uh, Kurtz. Motivations. Jesus. Deal uh, with the horror. Yeah. You know, stuff down that PTSD as much as you can, compartmentalize it as much as possible. You know, honestly, I don't know that it was PTSD for him. I'm, I'm sorry to, to go off topic here, but. No, that's fine. I honestly, I honestly think he was just, he thought too much. He, he understood too much, and that can be dangerous. Um, when you're sur- when you're in extraordinary, extraordinarily awful circumstances, I, I I think yeah he was highly intelligent, very introspective, but also had a massive amount of PTSD. I mean, if you That's look fair, at yeah. if you look at everything like this, they went over his his. I just want to say that PTSD gets slapped on a lot of things. No, I understand. And I, I think it, that was a factor, but there was more than that. I personally think it doesn't get slapped on enough things. But yeah. Yeah. they went over his file. I mean, I mean, he was reading his file, like yeah. all the decorations, yeah. everything he'd been in. So, I mean, this he was acutely aware of everything he had done through his entire career. And I think I think it broke him. Yeah, I think he stared into the void one too many times and the void finally reached out and he shook that hand. Yeah. Yeah. He just wanted to go into the darkness. Lawful evil. Yeah. He had a purpose. He, he had a, a vision in mind. What could I do with 10 battalions of these men? I could end the war in a week. He he had a vision he was, and he was working towards it. Very yeah. verbal about it. Yes. Yeah. I initially, when I was thinking about this last night, trying to figure out what I was going to say about the characters, I was trying to think, I was trying to say chaotic neutral, but I couldn't because no. he was, you're right. He had a, he had a focus. He had a plan. He was thinking about it all, organizing it. <laughs> man yeah. yeah lawful evil all right then we have robert duvall as lieutenant colonel william bill kilgore yeah oh, i okay. loved him he was lawful neutral as well yeah uh, his his uh his main thing was to take care of his men it was his unit his people with a long and rich tradition behind it and he wasn't above breaking the 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 bounds of good and evil to get there Doing what you have to do. Yeah. Okay. I, I, all right. At least that was my, my take. I, on I can agree with that. Yeah. I mean, he was in command, but he was also there also, to have some fun. Also my favorite character. I fucking <laughs> yeah, loved he, him. He, he had a lot of fun. Yeah. He was so 
difficult alive. for me to like, but also difficult for me to not like. Why? Why was he difficult to like? Uh, for you? Well, so much of this movie is compared to story. So I compare this to stories that I have heard from friends of mine now who have served, and it's a very different military because characters like that are few and far between now yeah. if 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 at all because and for example one thing that happened in the movie is when the two boats are passing and one of them throws a molotov on their boat well uh, the smoke but yeah it caught on fire well there is smoke it's burning <laughs> no i mean it <laughs> caught the roof of the boat on yeah. fire yeah. that was awful that was something that it's like that's court martial right now you yeah. know because that is essentially assaulting a military vehicle. And like, I'm just watching all of this uh, and that whole mental comparison between that time and now. Well, and how some of that is changed. situational, I yeah. think. Because, I mean, as bad as some of the, which is debatable, some of the military actions we, mm -hmm. we've taken lately, um, that was still, I could honestly say, it was a it was a bad moment for, for the military, for yeah. the U.S. military overseas. It, it, that was the worst place we've gone. It, it was because and, and, they, and they they lost it. You, you have to blow that off, man. You can't just internalize it or you go full Brando. Yeah, and you never go full Brando. <laughs> I, I I you know in listening to my my dad who who kept in touch with a lot of the guys that came back or made it back. Um, it it, it was a dirty war. Yeah. It, it was it was like the the first. It was really the first time where no rules applied. It was just go out do whatever and then come back and go back to your normal life or try to. Yeah. And we, we, we screwed our soldiers over uh, with that war when they came back. Uh, yeah, we really did. And a lot of people got screwed over. So again, me thinking about military and thinking about this guy being in command, oh, he fucking sends the whole thing over there for one fucking reason. And that's to surf. They <laughs> lost a helicopter. <laughs> they lost people. Because he wanted to surf. Well, that's that's actually incorrect. <laughs> he agreed to do what he was ordered to do. They did have orders to send him there. Oh, to and take out the that time, village like, so the boat will go up the he's, river. He's, he's also being told by somebody with, an, you know, somebody's come in with orders from intelligence mm -hmm. saying you're supposed to be. First off, he isn't at the assigned location. He just decided to kip off somewhere else to go fuck some shit up. Like, I, I just had no respect for him. It's air mobile, son. Yeah. Anyway, but I, again, it was like it was difficult for me to not like him because it was fucking hilarious yeah it's uh <laughs> it was nice to see a charismatic leader yeah. Yeah, it, and robert duvall does play a very good charismatic leader yeah. yeah and then we have uh frederick forrest as uh j uh chef hicks oh uh i like chef Keanu yeah. good I'm, I'm going with chaotic good he just wanted to get back home he wanted yeah, to do his job his and thing. yeah definitely chaotic he was one of the the good aligned characters like you yeah. could tell he was not okay with what happened on that boat he was very, very not okay very not okay and he dealt with it not by fucking up and not by opening fire he dealt with it by okay i will do anything i can to help you get this mission done so we can leave he was he was the one of the only uh one of the few good characters that were, were here mm -hmm. agreed okay. yeah moving on moving on moving on uh sam bottoms uh who oh. played the gunner's mate third class lance b johnson the former surfer he had a he had a sea change during his thing <laughs> he went from what i would consider chaotic good mm -hmm. to chaotic neutral slash high as fuck <laughs> yeah <laughs> yes yeah, very yeah. much yeah. Was, very 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 much yeah he just he just wanted to surf. He, he fucking broke man yeah, yeah. yeah. broke yeah then we have lawrence fishburn uh, as the gunner's mate, third class Tyrone, Mr. Clean Miller, the 17 year old cocky South Bronx born crew member. Chaotic, definitely. Yeah, he's chaotic. And I gave him teenager because he was 17. Yeah. Okay. That um, works. And if I was going to go for it, I'd just say scared. Yeah. He was he was out of his yeah. depth. He wasn't old enough. Yeah, I didn't know he, what he, he was doing. With it. Yeah. He was a liability. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. From start to finish. Yep. Hmm. Then we have Dennis Hopper, the one of the great actors of American <gasps> yeah. cinema. You mean Gene Hackman? <laughs> uh, he played the American photojournalist, the uh, the manic disciple of Kurtz. Yeah, that's that's chaotic neutral. Very is, much so. Snapped. That one didn't blur with me. That was like, no. yeah, that's where that's at. He was like, let me help you. What the fuck are you doing? 
oh, kindness, hate. Oh, well, you can see the bodies. Oh, let's not hurt that one. Dog. I mean, he was he was all <laughs> over the fucking place. He was, <laughs> well, that's I think more drugs than it than it was script. So, have you uh, seen Blue Velvet? Yes, yeah. I have. <laughs> How fuck good do you think that? <laughs> no, I think that's uh, <laughs> alignment, Dennis Hopper, which will translate in the D and D to uh, chaotic neutral. neutral. <laughs> yes. Yeah. All right, and then we have a very, very, very young baby-faced Harrison Ford as Colonel G. Lucas, who he was given his, he could name him his his character. He charged G. Lucas yeah. to honor George Lucas, who mm-hmm. gave him his break with American Graffiti. Nice. It's kind of cool. Yeah. Uh, he's not a good man in this. He's lawful neutral. He's just doing orders. He's doing his job. Yeah. yeah. And, th- and there's not a lot for him, but it's, no. it's Harrison he, he, Ford, he, so we're going to exactly. mention him. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. Such a minor appearance. And then we have Scott Glenn, who played Captain Richard M. Colby, who was uh, previously assigned to Will's current. I think we can get. I don't yeah, yeah. Was, yeah. I don't who know. Who? That. Cut who? That. That's it. Yeah. That's. Uh, no, there is one more. Who did you uh, want to go with? Chief. Chief Phillips. The guy driving the boat. Him? Yeah. Did I miss him? Yep. Dusty. <clears throat> How dare you? So Chief Phillips. Oh, uh, yes. Yeah, he is Chief. the only severe good line character here. He was lawful good. I, w- I would yeah. agree. Yeah. He he was Running concerned the for shift. the safety of his men. He was concerned. I, he was he was a good character. He was trying to keep them safe, sound, and off the dope. And he wa- and he was he. They always clashed with the authority too. Yeah. So yes. No, he was he was the only. <laughs> he was the only one that I thought was a good character beyond like, uh, you know, chef. Everyone else was either you know crazy or just. <laughs> Everyone else was war. Yeah, there, there is one other character. One What's other got? character is, is cameo he is uncredited. R. Lee Ermy was in this. The gunny from Full Metal Jacket. He was a, a helicopter pilot. Oh, nice. Yep. I didn't. I didn't notice. But everyone looked so young. It even yeah. took me a moment for Harrison Ford. I was like, "Where are your lines? I don't know you without your lines." <laughs> all over your face. Yeah, I, I think that's about all of them. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah. I'm not giving Arlie Ermey. Uh, no, no, no. I just wanted to <laughs> recognize him because he is he is a good uh-huh. actor. For sure. What... Sure. Yeah. Uh, okay. So this is a rough one to see what what happens next. Yeah. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Um, Are you going to take it to where they could come home and live, try to no, live their no, 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 lives? No, no, no. We're not. We're not going to take this into like one of those uh, born on the Fourth of July dating sims, <laughs> dating sim <laughs> RPG. Um, what I, a I, fucked up dating sim <laughs> RPG that would be. <laughs> like, okay. Uh, can I take, I, I just can I take trait PTSD seven times? Uh, yeah. <laughs> no, hold on. seven points in merits and flaws. Hold on. So who are the characters in this dating sim? We got John Wick. We'll put him in there. <laughs> that guy's got some trauma. Yeah. We'll put uh, Willard, Willard mm-hmm. in there. Who, who else? Um, well, they have to be some people for them to date. Uh, oh. Charlize Theron from Atomic Blonde. Yeah. Uh, uh, what's her butt for me on Flux? She's got trauma. Yeah, okay. Sure. Yeah. Anyway, it would be a fucked up dating okay. sim. Yeah. Moving on. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I mean, um, they, they would probably they would they would just they just thunderdome each other. Like, every, there wouldn't be any dating. You will they, be my they, mate. <laughs> <laughs> they just thunderdome each other. Um, I would I would say that uh, after reporting back to command, uh, Willard is definitely given R and R at least another room that he can break up and you know mm-hmm. get alcoholically blackout punchy thing drunken. Um, however. He is a person who literally did an impossible task with very few resources. True. The military, sadly, is not going to let someone who can do that go. They'll be oh. like, okay, here's some time off. Here's uh, here's your little fairy godmother department. Okay. Yeah, you feel better? Okay, we got something new for you to do. Um, You're going into the CIA. Yeah, they're just, no, they're not discarded no matter how damaged until they flip like Brando did. Have you ever watched the show Person of Interest? Yes. I oh, love yeah. that show. Yeah. I can yeah. see that. Yep. You can yeah, also totally. see the movie Red on Didn't this. See it. Oh, Bruce Willis movie. I would say that he is probably teamed up with other people who are in situations of similar surviving. Uh, we do have other movies of this era. True. Where one man walks out. So, you know, feel free Go to pick on. and choose. Please explain a few. No. Nah. No, I'm not. I'm not. I'm going to read through this. We're going to move on. Um, he will be teamed up with other misfits who can do the impossible and used to solve some of the war's wetter problems. Questionable. Yeah, the the the, the morally gray areas. the The party will continue to operate in the Vietnam theater. There is there there is a host 
of of different operations that can be done there. There was a lot going on in that war. It can be an air sea land adventure, though with with the feel of this, and this is the important part of this, is that this movie has a very distinct feel that's very different from the other horrors of war. Okay, it, you almost it's almost Cthulhu like level of elder horror. Um, and I'm talking about atmosphere, not, you know, no, the, I, the I, no, great I, old I ones what rising. you're saying. Yeah. But there, there is, there is a level to it, especially with, um, with the metaphor of the trip up the river, that's going to take a lot of planning, but if a DM can put it together, it would make an amazing game for your players. This, I, I think this kind of a game would, would be running this in, in the, if you tried to keep it true to the movie, would be a crowning jewel for a DM. Yeah, it would be something those players remember for all their lives. I can't imagine wanting to actually play this game. Uh, there maybe, are role-playing games that are yeah. just weird, though. Maybe so my niche. significantly more disturbed younger self might have appreciated this at some point. But yeah, probably, actually. But I game these days to escape. I don't game to come up with new traumas to experience. No, I, I can understand that. I, I, well, before we, we start, did yeah. the Stranger Things thing, though, and you brought some games for that. Yeah, that's I true. Mean, yeah. So before we, before we started recording, I, I made comment. There are two areas of of time that I just I would not play. Uh, this is one of them. The Vietnam yeah. War is one of them, and I don't know why. I just I, I think it's it's too much of a dark stain on our history. And the same as the Civil War. Like I, I, I see, I go to the gaming store and I see board games of like. You get to be the South or you get to be the North and you get to play. I'm like, why would you want to play a game based on the Civil War? Because I think it's dangerous to forget these things. No, I agree with that completely. I really do. But that's what the books are for. But I if, would if you not feel right playing <laughs> the Confederate Army. I think it's very dangerous to only. I think it, it, it just in general in life, it's dangerous just to deal with the happy bits. I think, and this is just me and I'm not, you know, mm-hmm. putting a value yeah. judgment on it. Yeah. But I think it's important to feel upset. I think it's important to have your heart race. I think it's important to feel shame. I I, I think if you, I if you, that. if you ignore these things, then you don't, you're unprepared to deal with them as they crop up again. And you're, you, you, you develop a turning away society of no, 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 no. Can't look at that. Where I, I think it's, it's healthy, like a vaccination. To have a small dose of it, such as a movie or yeah. or a traumatic night of, of, of a game that you really don't want to play. But I, I, I think I think it's important to take some of that in. I can't think of anybody that I would play this game with. That's fair. Because everybody with you, you're, you're a joker. Everybody <laughs> I know is a joker. And this isn't a joker's game. No, this is yeah. a very serious. Yep. It is a very serious there, game. You can yeah. have jokes in it, but no, I, 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 I could be down for a serious game. I play jokes and joke games. Okay, you know, when I'm playing, when I, I'm playing I just, the Killer Croc. I, I play the Killer Croc. I but, just, you know. I just, I, this is, these are the two times. Like I can, I could play tabletop Revolutionary War. You see, I, can I could see War Dusty War doing well in this game because Dusty's. There's a little something going on behind his <laughs> eyes. There's, there's some killer lurking in there too. Another genre that I. I can play in, but I cannot run as a GM as mm-hmm. I can't run World War II games because I don't like role playing Nazis. So, and I'm always the GM. Yeah. So you have and to, the you Nazis have to be are always the, the villains. World. And that means you have to role play the villains. So that means you have to role play the Nazis. And I can't role play Nazis. Just don't want to. Okay. So, a yeah. question What if you re- replace the Nazis with like Hydra? I fucking hate, it saying, I'm just, hate I'm just, supers. I know, but I'm just saying, I like, would you be able to? That's a really if, bad. <laughs> I, I'm just curious if you if they were if they were changed somewhat. I mean, obviously, if you if your 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 gamers, your players, they know that these are Nazis, but you you've named them something else. Could you at that point? I so I don't. That's like, an interesting question. I I'm okay with fascist states as a villain. Okay, but I prefer or as antagonists, I prefer my villains overwhelmingly to be characters with uh, intentions that. What makes them a villain is that their intentions conflict with the intentions of the party. Okay. Yeah. Not necessarily that they are bad. An antagonist. Not necessarily that they are trying to murder millions of Jews. Okay. That's something hard. Now, yeah, I, I would never bring that into a game. I can yeah. role play an analog. I can put this in a fantasy setting and someone's killing all the elves. Okay, let's go take that dude out. Okay. But once you slap that swastika on it, I, I can't role play that. I, I yeah. want to 
drill down one more on that, <laughs> one more level on that one. What if you're playing a supernatural aspect, like say, uh, Lord uh, of the Rings o- with orcs, o- o- Octung Cthulhu? Are there or Nazis in it? Yeah, where they're Nazis, run it. but but they've been overtaken by elder gods and are, like they're minions. So it's not humans, but it's supernatural. I will never use a supernatural reason okay. to justify the atrocities of Nazis. That's fine. I was yeah. just wondering how how like at what level you. Yeah. Are okay. Okay, cool. I didn't yeah. know that. So anyway, to bring it back to what I think yes. we should do with this game, <laughs> I, I just had one last little bit, and I think it's very important to extemporize a lot of atmosphere to give the game the correct feel. And the last thing you need is, as with um, Kurt Sprando in this, you need a villain where they can understand because he is he, agreed. The, his, 100%. His, his horror yeah, I, yeah. and his excesses. Completely. And his actions, they're, they're understandable. You you can't have a vague, nebulous villain. This is a this is a very human villain, and that has to be shown in order to give the feeling of this movie. Yeah, yeah, he is very human, and that does need to be shown. He has vulnerabilities, and and even though you know those around him might not see him as having anything vulnerable, yeah, it does need to be portrayed that he does have vulnerabilities. Yeah. He's not. He's not. As Nathaniel likes to use a super. No, he is not. He's just. Well, I mean, is he's Brando, not a mustache he, twirling. Is, he's got, is Brando he, a superpower? No, uh, he's a gravity well. <laughs> was All that ham. bring me beef? <laughs> no, wait, that was Orson Welles. Yes. I'm sorry. I I get the two confused in my brain. Oh, no, do you now? I, I, well, you know, <laughs> I, I I think I think Brando I think Brando yeah. had like uh he's got an extremely high charisma role. Like just in general, I think it doesn't matter how big he became physically. Yeah, he could just be like, yes. I don't know. He wasn't really possessed of much charisma during Island of Doctor Moreau. Oh God, he phoned that in <laughs> that so one, bad. Phoned it, <laughs> Jesus Christ! That was the first movie I ever saw him in, and I was <laughs> like, Who's this I, old man with the marbles in his I mouth? I felt so bad for Val Kilmer in that movie. All right, Val Kilmer was in that movie. Anyway, moving on. Yes. So I, what you I got? I don't have a game suggestion for this. Really? It just so happens that Matthew <laughs> brought one, and seeing as how it's uncontended, we get to go with my favorite. All right, tell us about it. Well, uh, it's from a, a company that I haven't spoken of before, uh, but I'll, I'll put it out what, here. What, and, what is this company? Oh, it's it's called Palladium. <laughs> <laughs> this is the revised God recon. Damn it. <laughs> um, the revised recon is a is a is an older game. Uh, it doesn't use the modern Palladium rules. Uh, now this I've copy heard it's very different. Yeah. It, it is. Uh, here, let me pass it around. Yeah. Uh, this copy is, it looks like it was set with a typewriter, I, uh, which yes. I'm not sure if it was a stylistic choice. No, that's how a lot, most of their old books from that era are that way. I, I actually, actually, Dusty, like, can I have that back? 1986. <laughs> can I have that back? That again? formatting is common to pretty much all of their books from the 80s, possibly into the 90s. That two column typeset, those, those, wonderful black and white hand-drawn pictures of guns and things that's straight up old school palladium i want to read what comes just before the uh the contents sometimes it comes as a shock to realize that most of the buyers of this game youngsters under the age of 21 only have a dim idea of the vietnam war regardless of what you may have heard the soldiers who served there and the soldiers that died there were brave and gallant and served their country gloriously the real shame of the vietnam era is that our veterans were abused and ignored the following books are only a few that give a real flavor of the war. There are only a few. <laughs> the following books are only a few that give a real flavor of the war. They are all strongly recommended. And he gives a, a bibliography of reading to give. I just, that, that was something very real at the beginning of a game. Yeah. I, I really like that. Um, anyway, let me pass this back to you. Um, so what exactly what may- is Recon? What's the elevator pitch? Uh, Recon is a uh, a quick game with disposable characters. Ooh. It takes mm. less than five minutes to make a character. A ah, palladium nice. game that takes less than five minutes to make a character because you go through them a lot. Uh, there is um, there's demolitions, grenadier, heavy weapons, intelligence, medic, pigman, machine gunner, <laughs> uh, point and radio telephone operator, and a sniper, and that's it. You basically uh, you take your mos you take a quick subset you have three stats and that's it you roll with that one thing that's very interesting about this game is it is very very possible to just get an average joe 
like a very average Joe. And one of the charms of it is the, the Vietnam was a draft. There were people there who didn't volunteer, who weren't burly farm hands coming up to serve their country. They, they were just people. And this game shows it really well. So a game about random people that were pulled from life and thrust into a harrowing situation with stats across the board. I really thought it would work well. It also sounds like Dungeon Crawl Classics. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I was kind of thinking the same thing. Do, what you could do is build a party of zero level people from various backgrounds, shove a gun into their hand and feed them to the jungle and That's see who survives. That's exactly what this is yeah. too. Oh my God. Okay. I'm interested. Uh, this, is a, this is actually, well, good. Cause it's, really <laughs> it's the only one. <laughs> um, no, this is, um, this is uh, an out of print game. I know there was a third edition. This is uh, the second edition. I know there was a third edition or a revised, revised edition released. Um, but I think one of our listeners would be able to let us know this. Oh, yeah. Probably. <laughs> yes, please. Um, I, I would like to say that one of the things I really like about this game is that um, while there, there are a lot of tables, it's like a quarter of the normal amount that you'd find in a Palladium game. And it's a lot of it is just uh, setting an area and what's going on politically at the time. Like every Palladium game, so much of it is spent on world building and what you will find and what you will see and what, what the tone of that world is. And um, I, I can't recommend this game enough. Uh, this is, it's, it's a magnificent game. And I think it was, this would bring what you want here. Cause it, it's very quick to pick up, understand and get right into the game. So if you wanted to do this as we normally do as a one-off, or uh, for your party for the night, this would be the game to bring. Right on. Yeah. Dropping napalm. <laughs> Has rules for that? <laughs> yes. <laughs> oh, and shooting blind into jungle. Dropping yeah, yeah. napalm. Yeah. 1D100 plus 50 per combat round of contact. Yeah. You don't want to be where napalm is. Yeah. Uh, bring your percentiles. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sold, Easy. man. Recon is one that I've heard about from another friend of mine who isn't actually a big fan of palladium but loves recon and he's it's a good we've game. never really talked about it and he's told me it's like everything that i don't like about palladium recon does right yeah so uh i mean i'm a big like, fan of palladium yeah but i love palladium, like recon but this too. is this is one of the it's it sounds like palladium does dcc it's it's not one of their um it's not one of their properties that i think they're still using but um it is it is one of their better systems the problem is is that it's very niche but i would honestly i'd love to see this cast in World War One, uh, World War Two. Yeah. I, I, yeah. I think, I think that the specific system used in Recon, uh, which does have Palladium elements, but is is a lot different, um, would be used because here's the thing: in a lot of of games about war, or and in war gaming too, like miniature heavy games, your character has to do something before he becomes real to you, like he has to survive an extraordinary circumstance before you name that character. Yeah, and yeah, this yeah, is yeah. one of those that you just you're running the machine gunner, you are running the heavy gunner, yeah. you're running the radio guy. What you just described there is how I play every single computer game that like that gives you a party, <laughs> right. but lets you name them. So, for example, uh, in both Darkest Dungeon and the recent XCOM games, whenever I start a new game of those, every person that joins my party, I go to their name and rename them to Nameless, right? And if they survive a mission, then I give them a name. I like that. That's yeah. cool. I like yeah. that too. Yeah. Yep. Anyway, so uh, anybody got anything else? I really don't. Like, I was actually thinking Dungeon Crawl Classics, but I don't know of any DCC games that are Vietnam era. Then this sounds fucking close. This sounds this even is better. really good. Yeah. So here's here's what I would like to ask: If you are listening to this and you have Kevin's ear, <laughs> let him know that. We're wanting more recon, and we think it would be a really good idea to publish it again and skin it for different eras of war. Yeah, yeah, I, I can definitely see taking it, stripping that down, and, and placing it like World just, War Two would template. work really well. Now, yeah. sitting here, like I know I made comment where I wouldn't run uh, a Vietnam because it's just, mm -hmm. but I would run something where you start in Vietnam. And then there's a whole timey wimey uh, shift, and you're transported to World War II. Oh dear God! So, so you're talking about Riff's America imperialism? I have no idea. Okay, <laughs> that, would that be sounds like one. some Harry Turtle Dove stuff right there. <laughs> 
I mean, I did. We were talking about the Civil War, and a long time ago, I did read a book called of Harry Turtle Doves called Guns of the South, yeah. where uh, Co-worker General, talks General about Lee that. found a cache of like AK 47s somehow. And mm. anyway, it's an interesting book. It doesn't do what you think it's going to. Alt history is occasionally yeah. Yeah. very enjoyable, and that's a good series. But th- this would be interesting if you, you know, take characters from modern day warfare from Iraq or Afghanistan mm. who are suddenly transported to Vietnam or transported back to world war one <laughs> damn can you imagine taking a current day <laughs> it, it depends like, on what, what you bring Navy with you SEAL. i mean no say no you're walking into a battle zone you're you are armed to the teeth you're going like you're in iraq you're somewhere in the middle east and you're doing a very deep deep cover op but you go through a door you and kick in that all door of a sudden you're in fucking paris as the <laughs> nazis are storming through the problem w- you is, and your is whole that platoon? the gun isn't that much better the grenade isn't that much better no, i understand makes... but it's the tactics that are used it, it's it's not even that though man it's it's the information sharing and you know it's the head cams it's the heads up display it's the cameras there, leading there would, back. There, there would be there'd so be advantages without, and disadvantages on both w- sides yeah without that and i'm god where's he gonna get more ammo i mean he he doesn't have a lot. I I don't. Well, I don't what, what's what's now, an AR? Would, what, what, what's it, is it an AR fourteen or fifteen that the military uses? I don't know, so I'm asking. Huh? What's the fully automatic U.S.? I don't know. I've never held one. Oh, okay. <laughs> it looks okay, cool. Well, okay. Let's, let's say uh, let's say a Vietnam era soldier has mm. an M, an M sixteen because I know that was the predominant yeah. American rifle at that point in time, uh, and gets transported back to World War Two. Obviously, okay. no M sixteens. What is that round size? Could he like pick up something it's, off of like a thirty out six? No. Like, hey, this will fit. No, it's it's like this big, man. Okay, well, I don't know. They're, they're That's tiny. why I'm asking. <laughs> um, it, it's it's a long range, high caliber. Uh, um, excuse me, high speed bullet. Mm-hmm. Unlike like the seven six two or thirty thirty rounds. Okay. Which or thirty out six rounds, which are big fat slugs that yeah. that hit you for zombie killing. Yeah, th- this is this is a nail. This is a nail gun. Okay, but if you have the guns and you have the ammo. And you are transported back so, to World no, War One no, or th- World th- War Two. The question: How big is the transport? It's not a guy kicking in a door. It's a battalion being moved. Well, no, a platoon. Let's say like eight guys. Well, if this is going to be an RPG, then it's going to be a five man recon squad. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And yeah, they do. They do have all their gear. They have their head, but nothing's working. So yeah. it, it's going to be. In, there's a. There's an advantage on on uh, and their antagonists because they can do different hand signals and things from a distance yeah. that they're not aware of. But it's we had advan- those in World War Two. I know, as well, I yeah. know. But the, the advantage would be on the the modern day going back because they have more up to date tactics and better training. Fuck, dude, I don't know. I mean, the the modern American soldier is a consummate warfighter. Mm-hmm. I mean, they are they are the most highly trained yeah. warfighter that has ever existed. Um, but that tradition didn't start immediately. I mean, no. like the World War Two. Um, warfighter would be very much at home with the tactics that they teach today. Okay, cool. Um, well, that tangent was very interesting, and I'm, now I'm <laughs> spinning my ideas on a one-shot war game. I will say this though: uh, <laughs> you're welcome. You, you can use recon uh, this system to play in any, and I'd love, I'd love to see a World War One or World War Two skin of this because this is so down with trench warfare, or and like it's it's a, a hammer crawl feel. Like you yeah, just get pounded yeah. and pounded and that one's dead and that one's dead. Don't worry. But we'll be doing this and you're sending us you have a folder of characters five minutes later. Yeah. yeah. So, Heck. yeah, um, I'm going to go with uh, Apocalypse Now and Recon by Palladium. Sounds good to me. Works great for me. Well, let's wrap this up once again, folks. Thanks for listening and join us online. Please uh, hit us up on Discord. On Facebook, Matthew's been pumping out some fresh memes on there. Yeah. Uh, pretty good stuff. And uh, right now, uh, by the time this airs, well, actually, the voting Patreon will be over. listeners, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you'll be able to still vote. <laughs> and uh, anyone who has not joined our Patreon, uh, we uh, encourage you to do so always. Yeah, and if you like us, you can drop you know, us a buck a month. Yeah. Throw us a few bucks. Help us pay for more pizza. And- However, if you don't. We'll still be here, baby. Yeah, yeah we'll, we'll still, still be, be here, here for you. We're we release these episodes, here. but you get it late, uh, early it. on Patreon, and Patreon backers get more votes. Yeah, for our next movies, and the next bracket that's coming to a close Ooh, is yeah. the monster ridiculous weird mon- monster, weird monster movie. 
Uh, Vote Sharknado. Vote Sharknado. Vote Sharknado. Sharknado. (laughs) I think Sharknado and snakes on a plane are uh, up there, but also I really want Zombievers to feel like a last minute win. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I'd be down with that. All right, everyone. Thanks for listening. I was Matthew. And I was Dusty. And I'm Nathaniel. And we'll see you next time. Thanks for listening to another episode of our show. We're still pretty new to the scene, and we'd love to get your feedback. If you like what you hear, please leave us a review on iTunes with your thoughts. Good or bad, they really help us get the word out. If you want to say hello, drop us a line on all of the usual social media sites. You can find the links right there in the show notes. You can also leave us a comment on our website at havemovieswillgame.com. We look forward to hearing from you. Have Movies Will Game is a Breakfast Puppies podcast production, and our episodes are distributed under CC BYND 4.0 license. Our opening theme is Rock and Gravel by Sid Valentine's Patent Leather Kids, with introductory narration provided by Isaac Scher. Thanks again for listening, and we'll see you next time. <laughs>